Ready to begin then. All right. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Sharik, um, the founder of Columbia Synapse. Who's really excited to just kick off this conference and welcome you to like today's program. So I hope all you all are doing well and keeping safe. So thank you so much for joining us today for the inaugural Columbia Synapse conference. So if you don't know what that conference is about, it's just an annual forum that Columbia Synapse hosts for discussions of disability justice, neuroscience research, medicine, rehabilitation, and community amongst others. So while our program was canceled last year due to the COVID-19 pandemic, as most of you are familiar with, as everyone's familiar with, we're really excited to come back this year with renewed energy and to have people um, to have people joining us from different parts of the country and even the world for some people who are joining us. So while the virtual world has felt impersonal and kind of isolating for all of us, we feel so lucky to be able to use the virtual platform to connect people from all the way from California to New York and across the world even. So the conference this year is also all the more special because it is during Brain Injury Awareness Month, which is, Mar which is in March of every year. And because you have healthcare leaders, disability advocates and nonprofit professionals from across the nation who are able to join us today. So on that note, I'd like to share with you the Columbus and Ask mission statement, which has guided our efforts and programs. Jeffrey, if you can go to the next slide. So yeah, as um, I see on the screen, as you can read off of here, the vision for Columbus and Apps was founded on and continues to be led by principles of neuroscience research, community, and advocacy. So when Columbus Synapse was founded in January 2019, this was inspired by, at the time, by the attempt to reconcile my personal intellectual background as a neuroscience and behavior major at Columbia with my personal journey as someone who suffered a brain injury. However, as the adage goes, the room wasn't built in a day, and the actualization of this mission has been a dynamic and an ongoing process only made possible by a team of individuals who have selflessly offered their time and resources to the Columbia Synapse mission. Together, we've been fortunate enough to build an extensive network, Jeffrey, next slide, by nurturing partnerships with various entities that you can see on the slide. So Jeffrey, if you click first, uh, on the bottom up, you can see we have various nonprofits such as Lime Connect, um, CCSD, Pink Concussions, My Negro Mind, and then you have hospital networks in the cities such as Columbia, Wild Cornell, Mount Sinai, and Mayu Langone. And at the top, we see some recent partnerships that we have with pharmaceutical companies, including Regeneron and, of course, Lundbeck, a Danish pharmaceutical company where our keynote speaker, Dr. Luthman, hails from. So and with this, this has allowed us just building a network as such has allowed us to engage a remarkable number of people in both the Columbia undergrad and graduate networks as well in, in New York City with a particular focus on people who have experienced acquired brain injury or who have an invisible disability. So network mem member engagement, as you can see on the slide, has taken many forms for us and has motivated us to curate a diverse portfolio of programs within three main buckets, as you can see, in neuroscience, community, and advocacy. So within neuroscience, we have lectures by leading physicians and researchers on the latest advances in the field. And an example of an event that we host in this bucket is our Resilient Brain Annual Panel, which invites clinical researchers and basic science researchers from New York City um, institutions who are able to present on their research and get people excited about the latest advances in the field. And within community, of course, which is at the helm of our advocacy efforts, Columbus and ASPE host different programs such as, as our peer support group and our volunteer buddy program, which tries to create intimate relationships for people in the community. And for advocacy, we try to leverage human capital and university resources at Columbia to advocate for the community to major stakeholders, including the mayor's office and different hospital networks in the city with whom we connect, including Columbia Medical Center, Mount Sinai, and Bayou Langone. We haven't said that, just sharing, you can go to the next slide, Jeffrey. Having shared a little bit about the history of Columbia Synapse and our programming, I'd like to bring us back to the focus of today, which is a conference which you all joined for. So the Social Brain, the conference today, represents the culmination of a year-long effort led by Bertina Kudrin, the wonderful Columbus and Apps Conference Chair, and her equally wonderful committee members, who she will briefly introduce very soon. And the conference program, as you all probably know through our emails, spans the entire weekend with narrative panels, lectures, and workshops on various topics, including biopharmaceuticals, disability justice, disability disclosure, neuroscience of trauma, mental health, and rehab medicine. 
So we're so excited and grateful for the time and willingness of all the professionals who have joined us today and who will be sharing their expertise and experience over the next two days. And we hope that you find these events just as rewarding. With that said, I'm now excited to pass on the mic to Bertina. Thank you so much for listening. All right, Jeffrey, you can stop sharing the screen. Thank you. Hi, all. Uh, thank you, Shark. As Shark mentioned, my name is Bertina Kudrin, and I'm the chair of this conference. As you just heard, our club works with invisible disabilities. The burden of these conditions is doubled as many individuals with invisible disabilities have to face not just the symptoms of their disease, but also the stigma that in our society still accompanies any disease that you can't see. Seeing is believing, and sadly, the opposite of that also holds true for many people. I don't expect that this conference will make some big difference in that problem, but I hope that at least someone walks away from it with more resources, more understanding, and less fear. And I hope further that we all learn something, even some small thing, for the next two days. I want to thank all of the speakers who have so generously volunteered their time, especially on a weekend and especially during COVID, as it continues to isolate us and exacerbate these problems. It was a long road to get here and we could not have done it without them. I also want to thank the Synapse Club members, Synapse Cabinet, and especially my conference team. Over the past year, these people have done every task, sacrificed their personal time, answered every text, all while balancing their schoolwork and other extracurriculars. And I cannot begin to tell you the stress I've put them through this past week in particular. I could not be more grateful or more impressed. I wanna give them a chance to identify themselves to you. Their names are Annalise Dotti. Actually, I'm realizing that that might not be possible if they're not promoted to panelists. Let me do that real quick. Or they could just like say their names in the chat. Or yeah, that's even better. Say your names in the chat, guys, please. Um, but their names are Annalise Dotti, um, Sam Danani, Edmund Chen, Vish Rao, Patrick Bosco, and Viviana Evans. I'm sorry, I wanted to give you guys a chance to say hello, but since that isn't possible, um, I wanna give you a big thank you again. I'm so grateful for you guys. Um, before I introduce our keynote speaker, I want to make a couple of important announcements for the conference. If you have not received the booklet and condensed agenda document with all the Zoom links, please indicate so in the chat and we will send those to you. Note that all of the times listed are in EST and the daylight saving starts tomorrow, so make sure your clocks are adjusted when looking at the Sunday times. Anyone working on the conference, including the volunteers and Zoom link providers, please be attentive to what is happening on the Slack channels and check your emails. And finally, if something comes up or an adjustment is made, such a session, such as a session being canceled or delayed, we will send out an email to participants informing them of the change. So please keep an eye out on that. And we actually, unfortunately, due to last minute issues, have had one of our workshops, the Compass Counseling Workshop, canceled. So if you were going to attend that, um, please keep that in mind. Um, without further ado, I want to introduce and tell you about our keynote speaker. It gives me a great pleasure and a real honor to introduce Dr. Johan Luthman. Dr. Luthman is the head of research and development at Lundbeck, a global pharmaceutical company dedicated to the development of medications for neurological and psychiatric diseases. As the scientific head of Lundbeck, Dr. Luthman has brought a new vision to the company and has been introducing highly innovative approaches to this extremely challenging area of drug development. Dr. Luthman has formal education in neurobiology, medicine, and dentistry from the Karolinski Institute, the home of the Nobel Prize in Physio Physiology and Medicine. During his career, he has served as a professor of neurobiology and pharmacology at several leading academic institutions, including his alma mater, the Karolinski Institute, and has worked in a variety of leadership positions at several pharmaceutical companies, including Azi, Merck, and AstraZeneca. His work has resulted in over 100 peer-reviewed scientific papers and has contributed to the success of numerous mental health medications. In addition to his professional accomplishments, Dr. Luthman has been a staunch supporter of social progress in mental health. He has provided inspiration to younger scientists who dedicate their talent and knowledge to combining brain diseases. We are really grateful to have Dr. Luthman's generous donation of his time to this conference. And now, welcome, Dr. Luthman. 
Well, thanks a lot, Bertina. I hope we are not running into technical problems, but um, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for the invitation. And um, um, I'm going to uh, present for about an hour, I guess, um, with questions and answers, hopefully, that fulfill your needs. Um, I'm going to um, take you on a journey that's probably somewhat technical and somewhat complicated, but I'd like you maybe to try to just get a feeling for what it is to address brain diseases, tr try to find drugs, understand how those drugs work and how we eventually may get them to human beings with horrible diseases that affect the brain. And I think, Martina, you said it very nicely here at the beginning, we don't see those diseases. Um, yeah, sometimes when you have uh, some damage to the brain, you can see that on people's moments and how they can operate. But many of the diseases that affect the brain are unknown to the eye. We cannot see them. And I would like to take you on the journey how we're trying to address those diseases. And uh, you can stop me if you think I'm getting too deep into this, Bertina, but uh, I'm very passionate about this. And as you heard, you have spent quite a bit of time on it. So let me get started and see if I can share my screen here. I hope you can see my screen now. Is it up? Do you see my slide? Good. Yeah, first of all, I need to say that I'm working for a pharmaceutical company and I worked actually in several companies, as you heard, I also own shares in some companies. And what I'm going to talk about here is really my personal views. It may not always represent what my company wants me to say. Um, but first and foremost, thank you all for organizing this meeting. Uh, TBI, brain injuries are horrible diseases. Uh, you all getting involved in this and organizing different discussion clubs from social brain to scientific discussion is really amazing. I think that's great. Um, who am I? Well, you heard my background, but I've been someone who's been hunting for drugs for over 30 years and I'm still hungry for drugs. And those are of course, pharmaceutical drugs, no other drugs. And medical need has always been driving my passion, but also neuroscience is my other big passion. And why? Because there are patients out there that desperately need what we do in pharmaceutical R&D. And if we do that job well, we can deliver some value to them. I have friends and family with brain diseases, close relatives. I grew up with brain disease around me. And that's partly probably why I have this passion. Where do I work? I think I'd like to say something about where I work because it gives you a little bit of flavor for why I choose this career. And um, as you heard, I've been 30 years in the pharmaceutical industry, but I landed in a company called Lundbeck. Lundbeck is a Danish company. It was actually founded by a man called Hans Lundbeck over 100 years ago. And the company is fully dedicated to neuroscience. We work 100% on neuroscience R&D psychiatry and neurology. I also like to mention that we have a very interesting ownership. We're owned 70% by a foundation. So the money we make go back into that foundation. And that foundation, of course, use that money for further investments. So they use that for, for, for profit reasons, but they also use a big amount of that money for nonprofit um, activities, including sending research grants to researchers in the field, quite a bit of money goes into research here in academia. Um, and a lot of that also in neuroscience academic research. And then since you mentioned Karolinska Institute and the Nobel Prize, well, there is something called the Brain Prize, which uh, hopefully in 100 years from now will be as famous. It only got a little more than 10 years behind it, but it's a big prize. Uh, this year's winners were actually uh, very recently announced and there were people working on migraine for very prestigious researchers. So um, you will hear more about the Brain Prize hopefully in the future. It's also quite a bit of money involved, 1 million euro that people can get. Lundbeck is located around in the world. I sit currently now in a, call, in a place called Valby in Denmark. Uh, but we have activities in Deerfield, which is outside Chicago, and also La Jolla, and activities as well in China, 
Japan, and Singapore. So I'm going to take you on a journey that I call the road to POC. Uh, and that's really how you take a scientific idea to medicines for brain health. And what is POC? POC is proof of concept. That's the signal that, is drug, that a drug is active on something that is not working well in the, in the brain, something we call pathophysiology. And that it shows some effect on those people with that disease. That is a proof of concept. If you think about it, you have a scientific idea. It may be a little bit of data in a lab and you think that could be useful for humans. That's a long, long journey. And the crucial moment to show that it works is this proof of concept. And I will try to tell you how we get to that point with a long journey beforehand. So how do we get the new therapy? There are basically two ways to get there. Either you have interesting biology looking for a disease. Some do basic research in a lab and they have some idea that this might actually be good for a disease. And they start to investigate whether that biology could take you to a disease and maybe even a treatment of a disease. The other way to start is actually that you start with the disease. Pineus Cage, some of you may know, a famous brain injury case. Um, well over 150 years ago, he got a traumatic penetrating brain injury and changed his personality tremendously. It was one of the fir first and probably the most famous case for traumatic penetrating brain injury. If you start from his angle and start to think, how can you treat his brain symptoms, his personality changes? That is a disease looking for biology. But if you start in the other angle of this, you know a lot about basic science and biochemistry. Then you have interesting biology looking for a disease. And we use both approaches in my business. So you have a great idea that is coming either from an understanding of, say, genetics, biochemistry, a biological mechanism, pathways of the brain, as we call them, or circuits. Or you start at the other end with the unmet medical need, clinical insights, or some genetic association to disease. And that interface, in that interplay between biology and disease, a new drug product is born. But this is a pretty, pretty challenging business. We call it risky because we put a lot of money into it and rarely we get money back because things are hard in our business. If you look particularly in drug development for psychiatry and neurology, if you put a molecule into a human being for the first time, what is the likelihood of that will become a drug on the market? Overall, it's 8% and for psychiatry is 7.3% and neurology 5.9%. That means that less than 10 molecules going into human beings will end up being a drug. Um, many of you probably follow the vaccine development for, uh, uh, for um, SARS-CoV-4 virus pandemic. That's a remarkable, remarkable feat what people have done in less in a year's time. That's a very, very unusual journey. And I like to say that that's very, very, uh, I kind of just admire what my colleagues have done in the business. In the brain disease area, you will never see a drug developed in a year, at least not in, in many years to come. Maybe we'll learn to do it faster one day and with higher success. Because we're dealing with something that is extremely complex. I don't want to trivialize things, but a virus is just a foreign bug that we like to kill. To treat something that goes wrong in the brain is something much, much more complex. The brain is actually the most complex biological structure we know. It's actually, if you look at it, even more amazing. The over 100 billion nerve cells we have in the human brain is actually more than we have stars in the galaxy. And each of those nerve cells have thousands and thousands of connections with other nerve cells. And the 10 to the 14 
synapses in the brain. Synapses, you probably know because you have that in your, in your title, but really this is an enormous complexity. And on top of that, you add biochemistry. There are signaling molecules, hundreds, thousands of molecules in each nerve cell. And all that complexity make us human. What we are, what we think, what we bring in as sensory information, what we put out as things that I'm speaking here. That's my brain working. I'm feeling maybe a little nervous talking to all of you. That's my brain working. It's an amazing, amazing organ that we unfortunately don't know so much about. Can you imagine them trying to develop drugs to treat diseases there? So it's challenging. It's challenging for many reasons. Challenging targets. I'll come back to what target is, but target is really what we like to address to change something in the brain. We have what we call drugability issues. Drugability is how easy something in the brain can be turned into a drug. There are side effects often with drugs that we develop for the brain, sedation, agitation, other things going on. Low validity of preclinical data. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, but we have what we call translational issues. Challenging diseases overall, every brain disease is challenging. And we have problems with some things we call biomarkers. Another little dirty secret in the whole biochemistry business, academic and industry, is that it's hard to replicate data. Some of you read scientific papers and you realize that this is really, really amazing science and this could become something breakthrough, maybe a drug one day. The dirty little secret I'm talking about is mostly that data is wrong. It's very, very often that preclinical, even high impact publications, data in those publications cannot be replicated. So we're starting with pretty dirty background and all academic research has to be replicated in industry lab and vice versa. Independent replication is fundamental for our business. This is just a long laundry list, but it tells you over three years, this, these were drugs, drug programs that were in clinical development for Parkinson's disease, autism, schizophrenia, treatment resistant depression, Alzheimer's, a lot of different diseases. And those were really looking promising. They were in clinical trials. And what happened? Well, they start, started to run into problems. And this is another problem we have in our business. Even if you go to clinical trials, it's hard to nail the information. You have often what I call the zombie drug program. The program what you don't know if it's alive or dead. It's walking, but it's probably dead. You probably should stop it. We need to get to more concisive decision-making, but it's a long journey. The journey to get a drug on the market starts with preclinical studies and continues with clinical studies. We do chemistry, pharmacology, we test the molecules that are safe. We take them into what we call phase one, often healthy volunteers and phase two and phase three, and then eventually you can find a drug for registration. That's a long, long journey in average about 14, 15 years in neuroscience from that early, early molecule in preclinical setting to a drug on the market. Another way to look at it is going back to that POC, proof of concept I talked about. A signal that this drug is active on something that is bad in the brain and you have a clinical effect. We start preclinically we fuel our drug discovery through promising science. We take molecules out of that, bring them into early clinical studies, and then we go into something we call full development, where we look at indications, disease indications, meaning treating specific problems with people of diseases. And then, of course, we hope to market the drug. What I often like to call this journey from a scientific potential to a commercial potential is let the biology speak. That's what we do preclinically. Let the molecule speak. That's what we do in early development. And let the patient speak. That's what we do in late development.
But that POC, that proof of concept, is the hardest bit of it all. Here you see some data on this, and I have encircled psychiatry and neurology. When you come as far as fairly, fairly big patient studies and you're running your proof of concept study, seeing if the drug really works as you had wished many, many years back when you started, only one in four make it. That is a lot of money and time. If you remember that graph I showed before, before you get to that moment. And that's really the first time you're running a real experiment to test whether your scientific hypotheses work. So how can we simplify that journey? Well, one thing is to do like Winston Churchill, just continue and continue. Um, yeah, of course, you need to be enthusiastic. You need to believe that this will work out one day. But you also need to be more successful you know, through really mentally focus and be more prepared for what is working. And I'll come back to that in a second. Well, it all starts with an idea. A scientific hypothesis or just an idea as we often call them. And the idea could be, as I mentioned before, some biological mechanism. Well, if we fiddle around with it, maybe that will lead to a new treatment. But it could also be from the patient's side, this symptom, this pathology needs to be treated. I have memory problems. I cannot walk properly. I cannot sleep properly. But quite often it's the last thing. Wow, I stumbled upon something interesting. Serendipity. It still plays a big role. But as Louis Pasteur said, if you're prepared, you can probably see it better. Luck you can engineer to some degree. Serendipity can be organized. It's a lot of science going on. Um, we, I had someone doing a search for me. Half a million neuroscience publications. That's more than I'm reading. Each of them pretty complex. And more and more every year. Last year, 50,000, 55,000 papers to read, scientific papers. It's impossible, of course, to keep track with all of this, but it also shows you how full of richness this is, how much we can do about it. So let me take you a little more in the detail on this journey. I already mentioned something I call target. The target selection, the let the biology speak part, is a very, very crucial element. And I will spend most of my time talking about that. But you also need to have the right tools. What are the tools? Well, one is the drug you're selecting to influence that, that biological mechanism. The other is what we call biomarkers. Tools we have to see whether the drug is doing its job, its business. And then of course, the indication selection what you like to treat in that particular disease. Is it Alzheimer's disease, the cognitive deficit? Is it something else? Let the patient speak. So let me start, oops, let me start by talking about the biological target selection. A drug target is most commonly a protein. A protein, you all know what that is. The protein is usually a globular protein, something in the cytosol of a cell. It's floating around inside a cell, but it could also be a receptor, an ion channel, and many, many more things, an enzyme, etc., that proteins do in the body. You often have a small molecule, that's the most common neuroscience drug, that likes to interfere or interact with a specific little touch point in that big protein. And through that touch point, you like to change how the protein is working. For example, with an enzyme, you like to stop its activity to break down things. Or an ion channel, you like to block ions to go through it. Or a D protein kappa receptor, you like to block a particular ligand working, binding to receptor. So again, you have targets looking for diseases. Maybe you have a strong basic biology understanding, but weak understanding what it does or you have diseases looking for targets. You start with a protein, 
And you start from a disease, understanding the disease, and you go back and looking for proteins that can do something for it. How many proteins can we play with? Well, here in other search, we looked at how many proteins that associate with the nervous system. The answer is a little less than 2,000. So think about it, about 2,000 opportunities to do something about brain diseases. Doesn't sound a lot in my book, but I come back to what we really have in reality. And here you see, sometimes I talk about precedented targets and unprecedented. What do I mean by that? Unprecedented are all those potential targets. Here I say 2,200 because I'm a little more generous. You saw it was a little less than 1,800 in my other slide. But there's something around 2,000 unprecedented possible targets in your brains. How many of those proteins have you used to get the drug that works on human disease and got it to the market? 30 proteins. About 30 proteins out of 2,000 are influenced by drugs that are on the market for brain diseases. The problem we have, the emerging targets, the promising targets, those that have reached that proof of concept I talk about, those are very few, three to five targets. I worked in this business for 30 years. Personally, I've been involved in two or three instances when I say it was not me, it was the global community of scientists, but I was involved in it, where we really took a protein and tested it and say, yes, it works. That's a very rare, rare instance in a career like ours, but it's the most rewarding instance in our careers. But that also means that there is enormous untapped opportunity here for new biology. And I talk often about sunset biology, those that already delivered, those 30 I talked about, sunrise biology is promising one, but there are some that also have really sunny days and look really promising, those that have proof of concept, but there are also many that struggle. To take those further, you really need to see whether you can have tractability. Tractability means that you can work on them. You understand them enough and you can influence them enough with biomarkers and animal models. So now we're getting to the tools, getting the right tools, let the molecule speak. Here is a very complex graph, but it tells you that if you have something you think works, biology you think works, you can go for it whatever you like. Antibodies, small molecules, gene therapy, oligonucleotide therapeutics. It's such a rare event to have something working in biology and particularly for the brain. So you cannot be picky about the drug. And that's why you have seen now last year, gene therapy drugs delivered on the market for neuroscience indications, oligonucleotide drugs. Those are not good drugs really, but they work and therefore they come to the market and help patients. What is very, very important for this tractability is what I call animal model. I'll come back to that combined with the biomarker. But if you have what I call validated model or validated animal model and validated biomarker, your chances of success are much, much bigger. If you have new, uh, if you have no way of looking at this preclinically in animal models, well, your chances are much lower. If you have no way to tell that the drug is doing something on the human brain, your chances are even smaller. I talked about animals. We need animals for brain science. I am fully respectful of those that think we should run fewer animal experiments. But for something as complex as the human brain, we have no alternative. We cannot study the human brain in a test tube. It's impossible. We can recreate on tissue, in tissue cultures and in slices of the brain, something that looks a little bit like the brain. But the complexity of that enormous or uh, enormous, the complexity of recapitulating with that very complex organ is just not possible other in animals. The problem is that most animals are, good in, are not good enough either. 
And you see here, actually someone did this work. Uh, it's a famous professor, she's from Brazil originally, but now she is in, uh, in Harvard, at Harvard. Um, we actually, in average, a human man, not a woman, she never did that yet, has 86 billion neurons, nerve cells in his brain. If you look at one of the close, closest uh, uh, primate species we have, 3.5 billion, that's much, much less. And if you look at the rat, mouse, etc., they have many, many, many fewer nerve cells. By the way, if you wonder, a dog has double amount of nerve cells as a cat. So dogs are smarter. So this is enormous translational gap. How do we get all the way from preclinical to clinical study? When it doesn't work, was it because the animal study failed to predict or was it because the clinical trial did not work out? So we talk about different terms here of models in preclinical, phase validity, construct validity. validity. But it was what it's really all about is to have something that's predictive. Some of you may follow this because you have this club. There are animal models for traumatic brain injury. There are actually many of them, probably too many of them. There are fluid percussion injury models, control cortical impact injury models, ballistic uh, penetrating injury models, a lot of different weight drop models, and even blast injury models. Many to choose from. How predictive are, the, are they for something that would work in human beings? We don't know yet because we have not been successful on that entire journey in TBI. The CCI model, the control cortical impact injury model is one of the most popular. Yeah, I tried to illustrate it here and it may seem pretty brutal uh, to a poor animal, it's often a rat. But what you do is that you have kind of a piston that you have an impact injury into the brain. And then you can look after some days into that brain, either through its behavioral effect, effects. So you look at how the animal move around, how it can finish a very complex tasks that you give to the animal, or you actually um, sacrifice the animal and you look at its histology. And when you look at the histology, you have a core of necrotic dead tissue, and around that you have what we call a penumbra of half living tissue. And what we often try to do is save as much brain tissue as possible by various treatments. The problem here is you run one animal model, you run another, and you may run a third. Sometimes you run four, five, six different animal models. And it works nicely. Your mechanism works nicely. But often it doesn't work because this is face validity. You think that hitting a rat on its head is the same as a human being being hit at the head. It may not be so. It's face validity. It looks fine. It looks right to do that to an animal. The blast injury model is exactly that's the. Um, the um, veterans uh, military injury, of course, that you're trying to mimic. Sounds very, very face valid. It sounds very right, but it doesn't really work out well so far. So what do we do instead? Well, we start now to study factors, different biochemical factors that reflect how your brain function. Those are things you measure that reflect how the nerve cell is functioning at the synapse level, at the cell body level, and at these processes, the axons. There are many factors you can measure now in animals and in humans, in clinical studies. And you just see an example here, but one that is very, very famous is that NFL, that is the little thing you see in the middle. That's nothing to do with National Football League. It's actually neurofilament light. It's something that seems to correlate very well with brain injury. And we have lots of data on this. Another that's very popular is neurogranin. And I will talk more about something called tau a little later. So what we do is that we study those factors in animals. We may still do the same brain injury in animals, but
but we look at those factors. We measure them in animals, we measure them then in healthy volunteers, and we measure them in patients. The big question here is, of course, that remains, will it translate to disease? Will an influence on, say, neurofilament light really translate to symptomatic effect in patients? That we don't know yet, but at least we translate the mechanism directly to humans. And they are, they are overlapping much, much better than running a lot of animal models and looking at, say, behavior or histology. So they have more relevant for the pathophysiology, what's going on, function, uh, biochemistry, by in, uh, with the biochemistry in the brain. But of course, will it really translate to an effect on disease? We don't know yet. But we know for some other diseases. Let me take something that is very, very straightforward. Something I've done a lot. I've been hap I'm happy to have been involved in two drugs for sleep disorders that went all the way to the market. They were both based on the orexin biology. Orexin neurons, nerve cells, that's the light switch you have in the brain. The switch that tells you to sleep and the switch that tells you to wake up. And we have drugs for that switch now. Those are new drugs. They recently come out on the market. They're very, very tailored for a specific region of the brain, hypothalamus, where those are located. But those nurses reach out throughout the brain and really regulate the brain activity. We have orexin antagonists on the market. And that journey was fast, precise, and quite remarkable because we could look at something called EEG. That's your electric activity in the brain. We can measure that in animals like rats, dogs, primates, and humans. And yes, by measuring that EEG, we actually know the drug works because EEG in sleep is very predictable in animals all the way to humans. Those drug programs, we know already after dosing in a few humans, healthy volunteers, that these drugs will work. Have we found the equivalent for TBI? or Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease? No, we haven't. But we're looking for those, and maybe those factors I talked about, those biomarkers, neurofilament, light, et cetera, is the equivalent to meshing EEG in sleep. So what we do in clinical development is a stepwise de-risking of the biology these days. We do things that we call proof of presence, proof of mechanism, proof of principle, and then again, proof of concept. That's a long journey to get to proof of concept, but we systematically go through that the drug is doing its job. It's hitting the target, the protein we wanted to influence. It's doing something functionally, proof of mechanism. It's actually affecting something functionally that seems to be associated with the disease. And then we take it into the proof of concept study. So we're much, much more informed when we go on that journey and we can find information earlier. So let the molecule speak to let the patient speak. How can we increase the chance to choose the right indication for those drugs? That's the last chapter here, the indication selection. Again, I have Phineas Cage here, the famous TBI patient. But it could be any indication. And I will take you on a journey with some other indications to give you a flavor for what that is. And let me start with a famous man and two less famous men. Alzheimer's disease, or Alzheimer, as some people say, but his name was Alois Alzheimer, German pathologist. 114 years ago, he described a case, a famous patient called August Dieter probably one of the world's most famous patients. August Dieter was a lady with Alzheimer's disease as we know it today, but she had a genetic form of it. We have discovered much, much later because they had some samples left from her. He described her in a case, 1907. There were two other guys, Oscar Fischer from the Prague school, and they were competing with that school that uh, Alzheimer came from in Munich. So, uh, and, and they, they were actually, uh, he came from Munich, Tübingen, but he, he actually worked primarily in Munich later on. Um, and they were just competing academic groups. And even back then, there were nasty guys in academia. So they were competing about getting the fame for this. But one that has com 
been completely forgotten is the last one, Salman. He was actually working as a student in Alzheimer's lab. And he was the first African-American psychiatrist. He was a pioneer in neuropathology and he went back to Boston and published a number of cases that were most likely Alzheimer's disease. No one remembers him. He's re he is remembered, Solomon Fuller, in, in Boston. There are some, uh, some streets, et cetera, named after him. But this disease could equally well could have been called Alzheimer's Fisher Fuller disease. So I actually personally like to rename it. But the famous patient is still August Dieter, although Fisher and Solomon looked at many, many more patients. They did a more thorough work, to be honest. And why is it called Alzheimer's disease? Because Alzheimer's boss, who was competing with the Fisher lab, Emil Kreppelin, he wrote a book and he called it Alzheimer's disease. Well, that was the original description. And it was based on histopathology, looking into the brain. Clinical description matched with histopathology, looking at brain tissues stained with different stains that were just coming around at that time point, including silver stains. What we learned after some years that it's not that clean. It's a really mis mixed and messy picture. There are many overlapping pathologies here. Vascular, other diseases, Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's disease, this is not a pure disease. So all of a sudden that Alzheimer's disease is not that clear anymore. And on top of that, we started to find disease causing mutations. In the early, late 80s, early 90s, a number of disease causing mutations were found along a gene called APP. So all of a sudden, 100 years, almost 100 years later, we had a completely different molecular genetic input into the disease disease. And we started to get a an explosion in an understanding of what the disease is all about. Those plaques that Alois Alzheimer described and his friends, Fisher, well, they were not friends, but the competing scientists, Fuller and, and Fisher, um, that is now described at the genetic level. But what happened thereafter, understanding that biochemistry, that genetics led to a number of biomarkers. Volumetric well, MRI, yeah, we could do that even before, but we have PET tracers, imaging tools that we can look at amyloid and tau. We can also look at cerebrospinal fluid and look at biomarkers, just those very biomarkers I talked about before. So all of a sudden we can start to segment the disease based on biomarkers. So from that patho histopathology definition, clinical pathological definition, we have now a biomarker defined disease a completely different way of stratifying the disease. And that has helped our clinical trials tremendously. This is a very hard disease to study. It's chronic, long-term. We have pretty crappy measures. Data is called CDR. Those are not good clinical outcome measures. Now we match that with imaging, uh, PET imaging. And you see down far down to the, to the left here, a graph how we can actually, with different drugs, this is an antibody against amyloid can do what I call in my little funny way, brainwash. You can go in and get rid of amyloid in your brain. And we can measure that in living people. So the trials have changed tremendously. The way we identify trials, trial subjects has changed tremendously. So we have more defined patient populations. One thing we learned recently is the other pathology. In Alzheimer's, you have amyloid and uh, plaques and tangles. The tangles are made up of a protein called tau. We have learned last 10 years that tau seems to aggregate and work as a seed in the brain, a little pathological seed that triggers the brain to go berserk. So you have kind of a spreading of a pathology throughout the brain. And there are now therapies in development trying to stop that spreading of tau aggregating. Tau is a very fundamental protein. It actually makes up your axons, the processes you have from the nerve cells. It's a very, very important uh, cytoskeletal element for nerve cells. But it also plays a role apparently in pathology and aggregates into what we call tangles that really look like tangles if you look at them by histology. The interesting thing is tau seems to play also a big role 
after traumatic brain injury, and most likely in chronic traumatic encephalopathy. That pathology occurs in those conditions as well. And maybe there is a seeding and spread of tau pathology after it hit or injured in your brain in some way. And there are people serious now consider to test those drugs that stop tau pathology spreading also in traumatic brain injury. Here's an example uh, from a Lundbeck drug, sorry, a Lundbeck, uh, Lundbeck drug that I took here, but uh, it's, it could be any of those drugs. Here again, we have an animal model, but it's a construct validity model, not face validity model. We inject tau into the brain and see how it's spreading, how it's seeding. And you see the histology in the middle and how we can infect this by injecting an antibody, stopping the spread of that tau. So we have a pretty good idea of what we can achieve also in humans. The big question, will it translate to disease? We don't know that yet for this mechanism. It's being tested as we speak. And so far, it hasn't looked so promising, but it's a long, long journey, as I told you at the beginning. We also have imaging tools. We have positron emission tomography for tau that can actually look at those tangles. Here you see the different BRAC stages. There was a guy called Heike BRAC, actually Eva and Heike at Kappel, that described different stages of tangle pathology. You can do that in vivo now with living people. So you can follow the effect of these drugs on patients alive. So what we do these days are have patients, uh, treatments matched to specific patients. I talked about the uh, Alzheimer's trials. We do treatments much earlier in diseases. We try to go prodromal because now we can detect diseases with biomarkers before you have symptoms. We can even detect Alzheimer's disease before you have symptoms with appropriate biomarkers. And we have spearheaded populations. And I'd like to wrap up with an example for something we work on. We work on the endocannabinoid system. Cannabinoids you may have heard about, particularly the exocannabinoids. That's pot. That's what, you, what some people smoke. But why do they do that? Because there's biochemistry in the brain that it influences. And there's actually equivalent molecules in the brain called endocannabinoids that affect the very same receptor you affect with your exocannabinoids, those you ingest or smoke. Those are cannabinoid receptors CB1 and CB2. And they're involved in a lot of functions that people that have used these drugs know. Um, but they're involved in many other things too, inflammation, etc. We work on this in the pharma industry to try to influence this biology from the inside, because we believe that will be much more precise at the synaptic level rather than at the broad level as the exocannabinoids. And there is a particular target there called maglipase. It's a short for monacylglycerolipase. If you inhibit that, you build up levels of endocannabinoids. Why do we think that's interesting? Well, it influences these two receptors, CB1 and CB2. And what could that do? Well, it could do a lot of things. Magli inhibition that you have in the middle could have effects on moment disorders, pain, psychiatric conditions, epilepsy for sure. There are already drugs on the market on, based on exocannabinoids for epilepsy, but also brain injury, TBI, stroke, and hemorrhagic stroke. Not stoke, sorry about that, stroke. Um, and the interesting thing is that, of course, the psychiatric conditions you can imagine because exocannabinoids have some psychometric, psychometric effects. Um, but here we also have ideas that it could work on uh, post traumatic stress disorder. It's quite likely because those systems are existing in parts of the brain we think are affected in PTSD. And how do we go about this? We're running a number of small, small patient studies with selected, because now we have 15, 20 indications we can think about. We cannot do everything in big trials. So then we're running small, what we call phase 1B studies. Let the molecules speak. We play around, if I may to put it so, in small patient cohorts to try to sniff out 
a signal where this biology can bring value. And this is a way to illustrate this with indication one, two, three, four. And we match that with outcome measures that are both biomarkers and symptom markers. So we have sleep, we have mood, pain, anxiety, but we also look at inflammatory markers, EEG, that EEG I talked about meshing in sleep. And we look at things like cortisol and other levels, biochemical levels that can tell us if the drugs are doing what we expect them to do. Maybe one day we'll get the same in TBI. TBI is a finicky one. Uh, CTE, CT, I have to say, is in some manner maybe easier to address because it's a chronic condition. But the TBI sequelae is an insult, an injury, and then partial or full recovery. And that very, very quick phase of TBI, we can probably not do much about. Of course, it's small repeated. We can start to protect people so they don't get injured again. But if it's one single insult, it's done. It's too late. We cannot be prophylactic when it comes to TBI. So the big, big question here is, can we do something about the neuroplasticity, the brain's enormous capacity to compensate? Can we stimulate that? But can we maybe also go in very, very quickly and protect the brain from that injury? Remember that uh, concussion model in rats I showed with the penumbra? Maybe it can save brain tissue very, very quickly. This has been done, studies have been done, and I'm sure you heard lectures about that before. But the problem is we have not yet translated this into something that works in humans. So we need biomarkers. We need to understand the disease better, the chronic and the acute disease. So there are many good studies now going on in populations, trying to look at what happens to different markers in those brains. Um, more chronic aspects of the diseases, but like we done in Alzheimer's disease, and I showed you all the fantastic journey we had in Alzheimer's disease, that journey is now happening for traumatic, acute, and chronic brain injury, including PTSD symptoms. And there are treatments now in clinical trials to try to find new drugs for PTSD, and hopefully we'll see a wave of new drugs also being tested for TBI and maybe CT. but we need biomarkers. And here is the numbers. The facts tell us that if we have a biomarker in a clinical program, the success rate, particularly at that POC phase, the phase two, is going up tremendously. You see the 25, about a quarter of the drugs survive, which maybe can go up, up to 50%. That may not sound very much, but it's an enormous impact downstream. So biomarkers are needed throughout the development to really shift so we have a more systematic way of doing it. And we see an effect now. We see more drugs getting approved by the FDA. 2019 was a record year. More neuroscience drugs than ever approved. Something is happening in neuroscience. Maybe it's what I talked about here. I think so. And many new interesting drugs are being deliver delivered, as I mentioned, like gene therapy. There is a great moment even for something as daunting and challenging as diseases for the brain. And we, I think we are on a good road from being completely disorganized and hoping for serendipity more or less. The road is paid by let the biology speak, let the molecule speak, let the patient speak approaches. And maybe we get our ducks in a row and we'll start to be more systematic and more scientific about how we do this. Before I wrap up, I'd like to mention one thing. Um, we're having here a virtual conference because of a pandemic. That pandemic obviously has many brain impacts. I often like to divide that into direct effects and indirect effects. The direct effects, some of them are very famous. The anosmia, the lack of being able to smell, and the lack of being able to taste. Those are acute symptoms that, of course, are effects on the nervous system. But there are many, many more things that happen. Um, and particularly, the indirect effects are very interesting. The social isolation, anxiety, etc. 
This is the stress test of the world we're running right now. There will be PTSD. We know it's already a fact in studies on healthcare workers, but this will spread and other people will experience symptoms that are more indirect due to this. But what is also very, very worrisome is that there's something called long COVID that many of you heard about. That includes a number of nervous system afflictions. Chronic fatigue syndrome is in the brain. The magic encephalopathy that definitely involves nerve cells. And we know about changes in cytokines and other immune and inflammatory factors in people long term. And we know that cytokines influence your brain function. Several of them involved in factors and processes that are implicated in depression and anxiety. So we are very concerned that there will be a, maybe a fourth wave after we have the vaccines that will not be by the virus itself but by chronic fatigue syndrome and other long COVID symptoms. We need to monitor this and we need maybe to have drugs for that also in the future. So I hope you understood a little bit about this journey and how exciting it is. It's target selection, understanding the mechanism of action, having the right pathophysiology related animal models and other models, biomarkers, 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 and getting to the proof of concept through a systematic stepwise approach. So I leave that for any questions or comments, if you may. Um, like to ask us questions? Uh, so we will transition to Q&A and Jeffrey, who you'll see on the screen, is um, going to take uh, moderate the chat and take those questions. Um, you can ask questions either in the chat or by raising your hand um, and whatever makes you feel comfortable. I'm just going to promote Jeffrey to co-host. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess we can start with our first question, which is from Nicholas. Uh, he was wondering how much freedom uh, can, uh, can a pharmaceutical company claim to researchers working in their lab compared to academic sites? I guess this is kind of like a comparison between, um, I guess kind of like the working environments that you've had uh, between like academic centers and then also like an industry center, uh, for example, at Lundbeck. Yeah, that's uh, something that we often call academic freedom uh, versus maybe a less freedom in when you work as an industry for profit person like I am. Um, there are differences, of course, and I often sit down when I hire people from academia and tell them a little story that there are three differences between academia and industry. And um, the freedoms come in many different way, ways, and I like to mention the first freedom that is different and more restricted in industry. You don't pick your collaborators. You have to be able to collaborate with those that are assigned to work with you. In academia, you have much more freedom to pick and choose who you like to collaborate with. Well, that depends where you are in the food chain also in academia. If you're a PhD student or even a postdoc, you probably don't get to pick and choose so much. But if you're a big full professor, you can pick and choose much more. But you get a team and you have to be able to collaborate. I actually think that's a good thing. You have to be able to work with other people in a very effective way, even though you don't like them <laughs> or have difficulties working with them. You just have to make it work because that's how it is, teamwork. The second one is you don't get that famous as you are in academia. In academia, you're driven by your publications and big grants and give presentations and be famous and get more money and more grants. That's how it works in academia. That's how you stay alive. In industry, yeah, of course, people self-promote themselves a little bit, but it's again that team. You're getting nowhere with your colleagues in that team. If you're, you're the one taking all the credit for the work or like to be the one on the front stage all the time, it just doesn't work. You can call it less freedom. I call it 
decent human behavior. The last one is that in, um, in, uh, in industry, you're not driven by your publications. You're driven by timelines. And here we go probably to the core of the question. In industry, you are given a time frame. Solve this problem, deliver something that can be uh, valuable for the company and patients within a certain time frame. If you're not successful, we will stop it. In academia, and many, many good academic careers were built on being just doggishly uh, persistent in working on something that some other people gave up on, upon. So that is probably the most restrictive in industry. Other people may tell you, stop doing it. We don't like to see it anymore because we don't want to invest more money in it. In academia, can continue doing, doing that. So another aspect I'd like to add is that academic freedom is getting less and less common, to be honest. And I touched upon it already. Um, you need to collaborate in big centers with a lot of other people. And you need to get that funding. And you need to appeal to those that give you that funding. So it starts to be difficult to really be the one who's doing exactly what you want in academia. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, our next question, I think, is coming from someone uh, with their hand raised. So, uh, Valerie, um, if you can, uh, I allowed you to uh, talk. So if you can unmute and ask a question, if it hasn't been answered already, feel free to. Um, okay, if not, uh, there's an anonymous question uh, here, uh, uh, which is that, um, are there any sorts of treatments that can be effective without the use of drugs? For example, do you know of uh, any particular um, treatment methods that can be developed outside of just like pharmaceutical techniques? Uh, great question. And of course, I'm coming from the pharmaceutical industry, so I talked about the good old fashioned drugs. But of course, there are so many different treatments that are not pharmaceuticals. And many of you of those, you know, psychotherapy. Um, phobia treatment is very effective. Um, you see uh, a starfish here, but if you have, say, arachnophobia or spider phobia or whatever you may have, um, that can be treated quite well with psychotherapy. Uh, psychiatric diseases, however, are not well treated by therapy. You cannot talk someone out of schizophrenia. You cannot do much about the major depressive disorder either by just talking to people. But in the psychiatry field, phobias can very well be treated by um, things uh, like uh, desensitiz desensitization uh, therapy. Um, I can give you many other examples. Cognitive therapies, there are many cognitive training exercises. If you see an Alzheimer patient in a nursing home, stimulation, doing something, bingo, whatever it is, is extremely impactful. It actually improves their performance on different memories, uh, performance tasks. If you look at neurology, I mean, physiotherapy, it's a major treatment. I mean, you, you train after stroke, you train after TBI. All that training is very, very systematic and very scientific. And what is coming more and more these days are so-called digital therapies. They're games. There are things on video screens. There are actually approved drugs for this now. For example, one for attention hyperactivity disorder to train your attention skills. So there are numerous, numerous examples. Often what we like to do is to match that with a therapy, a pharmaceutical therapy. So you get combination effects. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question coming in from Neo from the chat. Um, he says, uh, can you speak up with any knowledge about photobiomodulation and functional neurology as a treatment for long-term uh, traumatic brain injuries, um, either with hard evidence or anecdotally? Can you say the first? I didn't really hear the first treatment. What, what was that? Uh, photobiomodulation. Ah, photobiomodulation. I have to say, I'm, I, I, 
not very good at it, I have to say. I haven't been involved myself in it much. Um, I understand that's coming. There, there are a lot of things that are coming that are more, let's say, stimulating brain function in various ways. Um, and I think that is one of the techniques that you can sort of bundle together there. There's this magnetic stimulation as well, uh, deep brain magnetic stimulation, a lot of things that are coming right now that seem to have pretty good effects. Um, I'm really going off on a tangent here, but of course, deep brain stimulation, it's not what the question was about at all. But deep brain, when you put fibers into or electrodes into the brain and stimulate various brain regions, it's extremely effective. What people are trying to do now is less invasive ways of doing that. And that's one example, sort of. It's in my book, it's kind of a less invasive way of stimulating certain brain functions. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I guess a follow-up from Neil. Uh are people thinking of deep brain stimulation for dystonia or related analysis at all? A deep brain stimulation. Oh, absolutely. That's used for basically anything these days. People are trying it out for depression, many, many different things. Dystonia, if that was the question, yes, I know about studies going on um, to treat dystonia with, with deep brain stimulation. I don't know the results. Unfortunately, I'm not following it up carefully enough. But uh, deep brain stimulation has a very much developed in, um, in, um, in France uh, 25, 30 years, 40 years ago, uh, from a, being a very esoteric little anecdotal sort of kind of therapy to a really a, something that people are very, very interested in across a broad range of diseases. Its main place is probably Parkinson's disease and, and uh, now, but it's spreading really now. Great, thank you so much. Um... Okay, uh, and I guess this is the last question we have. Uh, your initial journey in science began in Sweden, and then you also evolved in research in the United States. So uh, someone was asking, how was the transition as an immigrant to the United States like or collaboration overseas? And do you have any advice for international students? That's, uh, it's, it's a great question. I, I didn't have time to mention that in my talk. I thought about that, but... Um, um, I think I'm extremely spoiled as a human being. I have had the pleasure to work in a field where I've been able to move around between different countries. I worked in um, Switzerland also before the US. I worked in France, a little bit in Germany as well, Sweden, now Denmark, where I'm based. And of course, United States, a couple of companies, a couple of places, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. I couldn't have done that if I hadn't had this career. I mean, there are other jobs when you can travel around like that. But to combine that with something that, um, you know, the saying that if you really like to love your a job, make your hobby your job, um, uh, this is kind of my hobby. And actually, on top of that, I've been able to travel around the world, live in different places, work in different environments. Uh, nothing can be better. It's absolutely fabulous. So I think a science career like mine is, you know, I can just strongly recommend it. We have something in Lundbeck called Drug Hunters. That's a very ambitious program to train scientists in high schools. And I know there are many efforts like this. There are many great high schools in the US that are sort of very science oriented. But I think this is a great program. Every high school in Denmark is invited to participate in. We end up with a poster the winners come to present posters. And actually we pick five winners at the end. And even the minister of education is participating in, in this event. But we're really trying to spread the gospel of science in high, among high school students. I think this is extremely powerful because I'm passionate about what I've done. And I, I don't want people to miss what I've done. It's been so interesting my journey. And it just happened. I didn't plan it. I mean, it, you know, people call me up. Do you want a job in Pennsylvania? Yeah, that sounds good. I took it, right? It just has sort of delivered by itself. Okay. Mm. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I guess we have just one last question from Julia. What does, what do you think about the future for treatments of Alzheimer's patients? So I guess like what would be some of the most promising things you think are coming up? 
Yeah, in Alzheimer's disease, it's been it's been tough. Um, we had some cognitive therapies that came 20 years ago. I actually had the pleasure to work a little bit on one of them. They are mildly effective, I have to say. They do a little bit on your cognition. And then there's been a gap of over 20 years when we haven't really been able to deliver much. It's a hard, hard disease. But as you saw, I kind of gave you some hope there. And part of the hope is that we now have drugs that can take out plaques, those plaques that Alois described, 1907. We can take them out with antibodies. Does that lead, does that convert? Is it going back to the construct validity thing I talked about? Does that convert to true effect on disease? Yes, it looks like it. There is a drug that's being now reviewed by the US FDA. It's called aducanumab. Um, and it's being reviewed by them. They have delayed the uh, review date and they had a scientific committee or an ad board that looked at it that was not so supportive, but it does have an effect on the progression of the disease. It slows it down. Maybe not so much, but it does. It's baby steps, but that's a very, very promising approach. And we have to learn much more about those drugs. There are a couple of more drugs that look very similar uh, from two other pharmaceutical companies, one where I worked before, that really look like they're doing their job. They're really having an effect on the pathophysiology and also on the progression and symptoms of the disease.